Welcome everybody. Today's a special episode of Scale Your Code. We're going to be interviewing one of the co-founders of Kubernetes itself, and that is Brendan Burns. Brendan Burns also currently works at Microsoft on the Kubernetes Azure team. Welcome, Brendan. Excited to have you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Now, Brendan, I'd like to start off here. I'm really curious about your backstory. It looks like you were a student and research associate at the University of Massachusetts. Now, I'm curious, how did you go from there? What were you doing? And how did you end up at Google where you co-founded Kubernetes? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I did my PhD uh, in robotics, actually. I um, uh, haven't used it other than teaching. I haven't used it since. Uh, well, hobby robotics. Um, uh, but I grew up in Seattle um, and, you know, I really kind of wanted to come back. Uh, it'd been a while since I'd been living in Seattle and uh, I had an opportunity to come back and, and start working at the Seattle office of Google. Um, and I did that and I worked on web search. Um, so I worked on Twitter search and a bunch of other sort of low latency indexing in the web search stack. Um that was done and that was about 2008 through 2012. Now you're at Google, you're working on the cloud team. Why don't you tell us where did Kubernetes, where did the idea of Kubernetes come from? I like to say like I, we, were, we were down in the bowels of the steamship, you know, I like I was so far away from users, um, you, you know, they use your software, but, but you're far away from the users. And so I kind of was thinking about how do I get back in touch with people who are actually using the software? Um, and cloud was growing. Um, and so I transitioned over into cloud. And, and I like to say, like, it was kind of a shock to the system because, you know, I was used to a particular way of building and deploying applications. And I step into this world where it's like VMs and bash scripts and SSH and just like, it was like a horror show. Um, and, uh, and, but at the same time, like, it was hard to see how it transitioned forward. Right. Like it was just such a different world that you didn't necessarily see how you could take someone along and you could sort of see shades of it. I mean, like the Netflix immutable architecture stuff where everybody was baking VM images was kind of gaining some degree of popularity. But baking VM images was slow and hard. And, you know, and so some people were using things like Salt or Chef to kind of try and do similar things. But they're sort of glorified. You know, they're, they're sort of glorified scripts at some level. They have a lot of the same failure modes. Um, cause you're still like yanking down packages on the fly as you try and deploy a, a machine. Um, and then Docker came along and, and I like to say what they really did is they mainstreamed containers, right? They didn't, you know, all the technology was there, uh, previously basically, but they integrated it together into this perfect storm of, of experience and meeting people where they were and all of the, the important bits when you want someone to adopt your technology. Um, and, and so that rocket ship took off and, but, you know, we were looking at it in cloud and, and, you know, what we saw as the real gap was the sort of like, great, you've packaged your application, you know, you've deployed it to one machine, but how do you actually, you know, deploy a complete application? How do you get traffic? How do you load balance traffic? How do you do storage? There are all these open questions around how you actually orchestrate an application deploying the software? How do you, you know, deploy software from V1 to V2 to V3 safely, reliably? Um, and, and, but you can sort of start to see people seeing these problems and they're starting to solve orchestration. So like, I don't know how many people really remember or were paying attention in that period, but we were paying attention extraordinarily closely in sort of the early 2014 timeframe. Um, and it seemed like every week there was another sort of pseudo orchestration layer coming out on GitHub, right? Like people who are starting to use Docker and starting to see that there were these problems and they were trying to solve them. Um, and, and that was really the impetus for creating Kubernetes with Craig and Joe was this sense that like, we really had a sense for where it should go and what it needed to be. I, I like to say like everybody had the puzzle pieces, but we had the puzzle box. Um, and so like everybody was kind of randomly trying to put the pieces together, figuring out how it would fit together. But we kind of had the picture um, and that allowed us to sort of really create something that I think captured all of the pieces that were necessary. Um, and, you know, it was pretty raw when it came out. Um, and, you know, fortunately, people saw it and were inspired by it, decided to sort of throw their weight behind that that effort and that project. And people like Red Hat and CoreOS and others really jumped on it pretty early. Um, and really help drive it because I think connecting it to real the real world and connecting it to real customers um, 
help produce, you know, what 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 is sort of a de facto orchestration standard now today. Now, Brendan, Kubernetes obviously has gone mainstream. It's one of the biggest architecture paradigm shifts in our industry in the past 10 years. Now, what's it like knowing? What's it like being the co-founder of one of those industry game-changing products like Kubernetes? Yeah, I. that's kind of a trip. Um, I mean, it's funny to think it once was just more or less a mix of shell scripts and Java on my laptop. Right. Like that's what it started as. And, and, and as a, you know, as a, as a, as a prototype, basically as a, like, here's an experience that we could do. And like, it was really pretty hacky. Um, and I actually went digging. I tried to go find the old source code cause I thought that'd be fun. And I actually, I think I re-imaged that laptop. So it's gone. Uh, I know it's totally too bad. I was like, I found, I found this one laptop in my closet and I was like, maybe it's on that one. And I, no, it's not. Um, and so it's too bad. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say that I think that, um, I really want to give credit to the community here. I mean, it is a group effort, right? Like I like to say, you know, we kind of, I kind of threw a, a pebble or a little snowball off the mountain and it turned into an avalanche. Right. So it's not, it's, it's hard to take a ton of credit, you know, you, you know, cause I think there's been so much work by so many people, um, to get us to where we are. I think that, you know, I think we set the seeds, we set the trajectory in the right way. Um, I really wanted to have an open project, really wanted to have a project um, where people could come and feel like they were empowered and people could come and feel like they could really contribute. Um, because I think having sort of been a student of a lot of open source communities over the years, I think that, uh, especially in the infrastructure space, the ones that make room for other people to be successful are the ones that ultimately win. Um, if you get too opinionated, if you get too dogmatic and or try and hold things too tightly, um, you just end up pushing people away. But the problems are still there. And so they'll just go find another more open way of solving the problem. Um, so you really have to build this ecosystem, build this community. Um, so I, you know, I think that's part of it. It was pretty trippy. I went to KubeCon this year and talked and I, I have to admit, I took some pictures of the, like the empty seats. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing to walk into an auditorium with like 3000 empty seats and realize they're going to be filled with, with people listening to you talk in like an hour or whatever. So I, I, I definitely took some pictures and sent them to, sent them to family. Now, Brendan, one of the things that I really like about what you're saying is that you mentioned that the community was key and is key for building tools like Kubernetes. Now, I'm really curious, and I know a lot of our listeners are as well. How do you go about fostering that open community that supports growth of something such or so amazing like Kubernetes? I, especially early on, I would say you have to treat every single user with just the utmost respect and and understand that like they're coming to you even you know even if it's a question even if it's the thousandth time someone has asked that question you know they're kind of putting themselves out out there to ask you and like if you alienate them they're not coming back and 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 if you do that too many times then you know a network effect starts right so i think one of the hallmarks one of the things that i think is really special about the community has been the sort of the level of professionalism and and respect that that you know we expect um, of every single person who who enters into that community, um, I, I think that that's that's a part of it. I think uh, you know I think it kind of depends on the project. I mean I think some projects can can have sort of a, like a benevolent dictator and be successful. Um, I don't think Kubernetes could have been successful with a benevolent with like the benevolent dictator approach. Um, you know, uh, I think having a really clear sense of why your project is useful and interesting is important. Um, you want to, I mean, I, I sort of joke, I was sort of joking with someone that like GitHub was social media for uh, a certain generation, a generation that's younger than me. Um, uh, I, I think if you're launching a project because it's like a social media thing, you're probably doing it wrong. You know, you need to like, yeah, I need to really understand why somebody would want to use use the software that you're writing. Um, just going into it and, and, and with that idea that you're trying to build something, you know, like I view it kind of like a fire, like you have this little, you know, early on you have these kindling and you have to be careful. Like every single piece of wood that's in there is something that you want to treat specially, right? 
Um, and, uh, and, and so that's maybe the way to, the way to approach it. I don't know. A lot of feedback too. I mean, so like we, we really proactively, well, we got on IRC and then Slack and Stack Overflow and really proactively tried to go and find people who are asking questions and, and engage with them on all sorts of different media, getting up on Twitter and all this sort of stuff to try and find the people who are using it, regardless of where they're asking questions and, and really get engaged with them. I think that helped a lot too. Now, Brendan, you mentioned that being open to the community and, and help letting them kind of drive the direction of it, set the direction. But as you were building this as co-founder, there had to have been something that you were very opinionated on or that your team was very opinionated on that you really pushed and really were insistent upon doing. What what was that or what was one of those things as it relates to Kubernetes? You know, I think we had we had one what I what I like to call like the leaving the floppy drive out of the iMac moment. Um, so I don't know if, if you remember or paying attention, but but when the iMac came out, um, there was this whole hullabaloo about like, it doesn't have a floppy drive. What kind of computer doesn't have a floppy drive, right? And like six months later, like no computers had floppy drives. Um, and similarly, when we came out, one of the really opinionated thing, I know I said mostly try not to be that opinionated, but one of the really opinionated things we did was to say, um, every container, every pod is going to have its own IP address, right? Um, and we said that, and there was just this hue and cry amongst everybody about like, how in the world are you, are we going to create a network model where that works? How do you do the network? And one, so one of the big complexities early on for people installing a Kubernetes cluster was just making the networking work, right? Um, and... Um, but we really stuck to our guns. It was a place where we were like, no, this is really important. We really, really, really have to do this. Um, and, you know, pe- you know, people like CoreOS came out with Flannel that made it a lot easier. And, and you know, six months later, it was just like the, accept- it was the accepted way of doing this stuff, right? Like it was, it was like people like, oh, right. And, and I think that that's, a, that's an example where leadership actually is important and having opinions is really important because if we hadn't done that, I think we'd, you know, we would be in a world of port remapping and, and random, you know, machines running or processes running on random ports and stuff like that. And things like DNS don't work. Um, and, and it would be a much worse world. Right. And, but no one would have really known because no one knew that you should say like, no, this is actually something we really need to do because people didn't have some of the experience that we had. Um, and and so that's been interesting. So that's an example, I think, where we had an opinion and, and we really stuck to it and it proved out. Now, Brendan, that networking is a great example of something that seemed really challenging. There had to have been more challenges as it relates to building something like Kubernetes. What 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 were some of those that you encountered? You know, early on, we, we had uh, just uh, homogenous replication, right? You want to replicate containers. Every single container is identical. If we're going to scale down, we're going to choose a container at random to destroy. Really tell, told the, app, the application developer, like, they're all the same. You have to treat them all the same. If you want to treat them specially, you need to do that in your code. Kubernetes is not going to know anything about that, right? It's your problem. Um, and, and, you know, we saw people starting to try to deploy things that had a little bit, that weren't necessarily written for a world like that. Um, you know, the classic examples were things like Mongo uh, or Redis or some of these more stateful workloads. Um, and people just struggled and were doing these incredibly hacky scripting gymnastics to kind of like take an application that expected each member to be identifiable and bridge them to a world of Kubernetes where each member of a replication set was pretty much interchangeable. Um, and it was really ugly. Um and so that feedback from people about how bad it was um, led to the development of stateful sets where we kind of stepped back from our purism a little bit and we sort of said, okay, you know, we're going to actually let Kubernetes kind of know that these containers are individuals and they have individual identity and we'll give you some guarantees about, you know, we'll create the zeroth replica and wait for it to go healthy before we create the first replica and then we'll create the second replica and so on. And like you look at the difference in complexity in deploying Mongo in a stateful set versus a replica set, and it's like night and day, right? It's like stateful set is like, boom, done, five minutes, right? And replica set, it's like giant bash scripts, flaky, da, 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 da. Um, and I think that's a really good example of where we kind of had a strong opinion, um, but we were wrong. Um, or at least it was a, an opinion that wouldn't work well for a large part of the community. Um, and we actually 
you know, listened and, and did the work to develop a solution that worked a lot better. Um, and so I think you got to do both, right? Like sometimes your ideas prove out and sometimes you were just wrong or, or it was just too hard and, and you need to have some flexibility on either side. Um, so I think those are, those are kind of help illustrate both sides of that coin. Brendan, looking ahead, I'm curious what you see happening with virtual machines. Do you feel, do you feel they're going to be completely replaced, d- disrupted? Uh, you know, where do you feel like containers are heading, you know, from a serverless standpoint, from a futuristic standpoint? You know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I mean, I think, well, one thing is for sure is that, that like the legacy will always be with us, right? Like, um, I just was reading some article about how s- some nuclear power plant is planning on running a PDP-11 until 2050, right? So, like, I mean, I, you know, the legacy is always going to be with us. Um, and so I I don't think you'll ever be in a world where, you know, there aren't virtual machines around. Um, I do think that most developers want to consume this as containers. I don't think they really care about the operating system or want to know about the operating system. Um, and, you know, so I think that you're starting to see, um, that technological shift happen with the cloud. Um, I think outside of the cloud, it doesn't matter perhaps quite as much because of course, like the machines have to be there. So somebody has to run them. So like, you know, um, but in the cloud, you know, with things like uh, Azure container instances that we launched recently, it's serverless containers. You give us a container, we run it for you. It fails, we restart it. You don't ever see the machine that it's running on, right? Um, and I think that's an abstraction that a lot of people want to consume. Um, and so I, I do think that containers are going to become increasingly the sort of the runnable thingy, especially in the cloud. Um, I think I hope that Kubernetes kind of fades to the background um, as we see people build things on top, right? I view Kubernetes and the Kubernetes APIs as being sort of like POSIX, right? You know, every program that you ever write, run on a you know on a Linux system runs via POSIX APIs, but you don't really think about them very much. You know, you learn them in operating systems and maybe you do some pthreads or whatever, but like. You don't think about them very much, um, and and I kind of hope that that's where we end up with Kubernetes as well. That it fades to the background. It's important and it's useful and it's something that sort of is a backbone of everything that that you do. Um, but you're thinking about higher level abstractions. You know, I don't think that the Kubernetes abstractions were built for developers. Um, I think we need you know, you're and you're starting to see that right. You're seeing people layer functions as a service on top, or you're seeing people layer package management on top. Um, I think you're you're just going to see an increase of, of people building more opinionated experiences on top of Kubernetes that uh, attract a particular subsection of the developer community. And so, and, and I think the great thing about Kubernetes though is you can mix and match, right? So you want to use functions as a service or some stuff? Great. Install a functions as a service on top of your cluster. You can use the functions as a service developer pa- pattern. You want to use package management? Great. You can go use Helm to install Cassandra or Helm to install MySQL. Um, You need raw access to Kubernetes because you're doing advanced stuff? Well, that API is still there. And the good thing is they all interoperate and they all run on the same machines. Um, And so, like, I think it provides a a nice abstraction layer that you can, a foundation that you can build up from. Um, And and as we do that, I kind of hope that it, it fades into the background. Brennan, this was absolutely amazing. It was a pleasure speaking with you and I'd love to have you on again in the future. And I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us today. Absolutely, would love to do it. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Everybody, don't forget to subscribe for more amazing interviews from Scale Your Code and also check out our other podcasts that are not part of Linux Academy, such as Linux Action News, Linux Unplugged, Coder Radio, TechSnap, and User Air. Look forward to seeing you in the future and subscribe to follow along. Thank you.